kabone ntabwo ari kimwe rero n'ukuntu nari nahoze mu mwijima none ndi mu mucyo ndashimira leta y'u Rwanda na BRD ko yangejeje kuri byinshi nandi bo ngubu kubancana no munezero kuri nje ndashimira no mukuru w'igihugu wabidutegureye akaba yabona yuko natwe twari twari dukwiriye kujya mu mucyo bonye uko namukora mu noki ndana mukora mu noki nukuri yarakoze nabashaga kujya ngo mbashe kujya mboneshe nafata gashirira se nabo nabuze uduhuye two kugura gatoroshi cyane tukagerageza ubujyo na sasa hakiri kare kugira ngo mbe naryama ibintu byo kuba nakwitegura mu nzu nyine baradusaidiye cyane uko nagura akabe ko gushira mu itoroshe nagacara umusomo akaba gashijemo yo kubona rayibetse ubundi cyane nakibaza nabombaga gucana ngacana itoroshi kuko yangejeje ku mugoro basimba ndeba ari ku ngubo hose hose no murugo hose gaye habone namaze ko no matarano wandishimye ndishima cyane birenze kuko no neshemye ko ya byare bibazo aho ufata iyo shiro mu rakaja zo nguza kaisane peretse none ana bona yitara ndashana kibazo ikintu cyahindutse nibyi nchi ari abana barakina neza nange ngakora neza ndashimira leta y'umwe na mahoro ifatanije no beride ko kubunga ubuturi uwari wowe sagara hano akamenya urugo rwakana aka tera ni kwakana aka bitse nuko ababona ntabwo ari kimwe rero n'ukuntu nari nahoze mu mwijima none ndi mu mucyo ndashimira leta y'u Rwanda na BRD ko yangejeje kuri byinshi nandi bo ngubu kubancana no munezero kuri nje ndashimira no mukuru w'igihugu wabidutegureye akaba yabona yuko natwe twari twari dukwiriye kujya mu mucyo bonye uko namukora mu noki ndana mukora mu noki nukuri yarakoze nabashaga kujya ngo mbashe kujya mboneshe nafata gashirira se nabo nabuze uduhuye two kugura gatoroshi cyane tukagerageza ubujyo na sasa hakiri kare kugira ngo mbe naryama ibintu byo kuba nakwitegura mu nzu nyine baradusaidiye cyane uko nagura akabe ko gushira mu itoroshe nagacara umusomo akaba gashijemo yo kubona rayibetse ubundi cyane nakibaza nagombaga gucana ngacana itoroshi kuko yangejeje ku mugoro basimba ndeba ari ku ngubo hose hose no murugo hose gaye habonanye namaze ko no matarano wandishimye ndishima cyane birenze kuko no neshemye ko ya byare bibazo aho ufata iyo shiro mu rakaja zo nguza kaisane peretse none ana bona yitara ndashana kibazo ikintu cyahindutse nibyi nchi ari abana barakina neza nange ngakora neza ndashimira leta y'umwe na mahoro ifatanije no beride 
Kokubungu Tri, whatever was Agara, no coming, you look on Waka Naka, Teran Quaka Naka, Little Luka Abon. Now, what is Timur Luku, no Nalim, Naho, the Mumu, Juma, no, no, the Mumucho. The Shimare Tayurban and a very day. Quayanjas is a Kuribjin, Chinan, Jungu, Kubanchana, no Munes, no Kurinj. Hashimira no Kuruji Hugo, Babidu Tegura. Akawa yabona yuko natwe twari twari dukwiriye kujya mu mucyo mbonye uko namukora mu noki na namukora mu noki nukuri yarakoze Nabashaga kujya ngo mbashe kujya mboneshe nafata gashirira se nabo nabuze uduhuye two kugura gatoroshi cyane tukagerageza ubujyo na sasa hakiri kare kugira ngo mbe Good evening again Hello Hello nabashaga kujya ngo mbashe kujya mboneshe nafata gashirira se nabo nabuze uduhuye two kugura gatoroshi cyane tukagerageza ubujyo na sasa hakiri kare kugira ngo mbe naryama ibintu byo kuba nakwitegura mu nzu nyine mwaradusaidiye cyane uko nagura akawe ko gushira mu itoroshi agacara umusomo akaba gashijemo ryo kubona rayibitse ubonda cyane nakibaso nagombaga gucana ngacana itoroshi kuko iyo ngejeje ku mugoro basimba ndeba ari ku ngubo hose hose no murugo hose gaye habonanye namaze kwana mu matarano wa ndishimye ndishimye cyane birenze kuko none shemya kuyabyare bibazo 
ari ufata iyo shiri mu rakaja zongo za Kalisane Teresa nana nabona yitara ndacana na kibazo ikintu cyahindutse ni byinshi ari abana barakina neza nange ngakora neza ndashimere tayo mwe na mahoro ifata ni de nouvelle ko kubunga ubuturi ubwari wowe sagara hano akamenye urugo rwakana aka tera ni kwakana aka bite nuko ababona ntabwo ari kimwe rero nuko ntu nari nahoze mu mwijima no nundi mu mucyo ndashimira leta y'u Rwanda na BRD ko yangejeje kuri byinshi nandi ubu ngubu kubancana no munezero kuri nge hashimira no mukuru w'igihugu wabidutegureye akaba yabona yuko natwe twari twari dukwiriye kujya mu mucyo bonye uko namukora mu noki nana mukora mu noki nukuri yarakoze nabashaga kujya ngo mbashe kujya mboneshe nafata gashirira se nabo nabuze uduhuye two kugura gatoroshi cyane tukagerageza ubujyo nana sasa hakiri kare kugira ngo mbe naryama ibintu byo kuba nakwitegura mu nzu nyine mwaradusaidiye cyane uko nagura akawe ko gushira mu itoroshi agacana umusomo akaba gashijemo ariko ubona rayibitse ubona cyane nakibaso nagombaga gucana ngacana itoroshi kuko yo ngejeje ku mugoro basimba ndeba ari ku ngubo hose hose no mu rugo hose gaye habonanye namaze kwana mu matarano wa ndishimye ndishimye cyane birenze koko no neshemye kuya byare bibazo ari ufata iyo shiri mu rakaja zongo za Kalisane Teresa nana nabona yitara ndacana na kibazo ikintu cyahindutse ni byinshi ari abana barakina neza nange ngakora neza ndashimere tayo mwe na mahoro ifata ni de nouvelle ko kubunga ubuturi ubwari wowe sagara hano akamenye urugo rwakana aka tera ni kwakana aka bite nuko ababona ntabwo ari kimwe rero nuko ntu nari nahoze mu mwijima no nundi mu mucyo ndashimira leta y'u Rwanda na BRD ko yangejeje kuri byinshi nandi ubu ngubu kubancana no munezero kuri nge hashimira no mukuru w'igihugu wabidutegureye akaba yabona yuko natwe twari twari dukwiriye kujya mu mucyo bonye uko namukora mu noki nana mukora mu noki nukuri yarakoze Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to our first of many Let's Conversate uh, session organized by BRD. My name is Zaina. I am part of the BRD team. And for those that were paying attention to the video just before, it's a video about a Chana challenge. For those that haven't heard about it, it's a challenge that uh, allowed us to actually provide, raise funds and provide electricity to over 10,000 homes across the country. So just a quick round of applause for that. So today is about creating a platform where we have different guest speakers, different experts that will share their expertise, their experience, where we'll be able to challenge them, challenge each other, and ultimately learn. And of course, while enjoying ourselves, I hope everybody was able to grab a drink. If not, it's right behind. So feel free to go in between uh, speeches. So briefly to tell you how um, the session will go today. So we're gonna have two guest speakers. 
followed by a panel discussions where we invited four panelists from different organizations. It will be followed by a Q&A session. And at the end, we'll have a, an interesting challenge for all the entrepreneurs in the room. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first special guest, Mr. Jean-Paul Adam. He uh, was previously the finance minister in the Seychelles, and he's currently the director of UNECA. Welcome. Thank you very much. Is it okay for me to stand and speak? Okay. So good afternoon, uh, everyone. And first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to join you. Uh, as has already been mentioned, uh, I'm Jean-Paul Adam. I'm the director for technology, climate change, and natural resources management at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. At the UN, we have lots of different portfolios. We all put them together, so our titles become very, very long. And uh, I previously served as the Minister of Finance of Seychelles, uh, and I was briefly as well the, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Minister of Health as well. So that was a little bit that, that experience. I'm currently in Kigali because we just had the African Regional Forum on Sustainable Development. And in fact, the high-level panel of that forum was about unlocking finance for the Sustainable Development Goals. And we really need, before I will go into sharing some of the experiences on uh, Seychelles, on the Blue Bond, I think it's important that we understand the scale of what is needed in terms of finance. Uh, firstly, Mother, how long do I have? <laughs> 10 minutes, okay. So you'll just do a sign when I'm two minutes left. Very good. Uh, so the, in terms of the response to COVID-19, in the low-income countries globally, about two-thirds of which are African, the spending per capita was only 57 US dollars per capita. In the developed world, in the OECD countries and others, the spending was over $11,000 per capita. So there's a huge difference in how we can respond to emergencies. Of course, we're talking now about the emergency of COVID-19, but climate change is as big an emergency for Africa. To note that for every two degrees of warming, Africa is expected to lose 5% of GDP. When you have, and we are currently on 2.4 degrees of warming, that's the trajectory that we are currently on, based on the Glasgow uh, meeting. So the impact of climate change will make us lose a lot of money. The growth rate, as we all know, is well below 5%. So we are in for a very difficult economic situation. And one of the key themes of the regional forum was how African countries can actually grow themselves to raise the revenues needed to invest in fantastic projects such as providing electricity, affordable housing, and all of the elements which are associated with sustainable development. The now to my experience when I was the finance minister of Seychelles. Uh, Seychelles is now actually uh, a uh, high-income country. But it's important to contextualize this. All, of the, all of the calculations about whether a country is low-income, middle-income, or high-income, it's per capita. And therefore, it doesn't actually calculate properly the ability of a country to invest. Seychelles, which has only 100,000 people, just 100,000, it's the smallest country in Africa, uh, has a lot of difficulty, so it has a, a per capita income, which is higher than Poland, higher than certain members of the European Union, but its investment capacity is very different from Poland or from other members of the European Union, because, the, because of the issues of economies of scale. You can't make your airport any shorter just because you are small. Right? You can't, there's a minimum depth for your port. And Rwanda is quite a bit bigger than Seychelles, but it is still a small country. And actually the majority of countries in Africa have this scale issue, where you are not able to mobilize huge amounts of investment also because you have limited scale. So you've got some countries that effectively drew, you know, managed to get a large number of people out of poverty because they created scale and therefore created a lot of investment opportunity relatively quickly. Seychelles, despite having very good economic indicators, a high GDP per capita, was no longer able to access concessional finance and was faced with having to 
raise money from the international market on commercial rates. And around the time of the economic crisis of 2008, 2009, that meant close to 10%, which was extremely expensive. Uh, so afterwards, when I was involved, I was Minister of Finance in 2015. We were trying to raise financing at a much more affordable rate, uh, and we also had a large amount of debt. So in fact, the story about how we did a blue bond issuance, we like a green bond, but ours was linked to ocean-based projects, it actually started first with a debt for climate adaptation swap. Because first we had to create some space in our debt portfolio. We had a debt to GDP ratio uh, before we started reforming of almost 150%. So it was very, very high. In terms of the debt swap that we did, we targeted a relatively small amount of our debt. And what we did was that we got support from an NGO called the Nature Conservancy, and we bought back about $30 million of our debt. And then that debt was refinanced domestically. So we turned it from a dollar debt into a Seychelles rupee debt. And so we were paying now uh, in Seychelles rupees, which made it much more affordable. And also uh, the interest rate, because the, the partner agreed to take a big haircut on the interest rate. So the average interest rate went from 7% to below 3%. And the deal that we did on the debt swap was that the savings, the commitment we made, was that the savings would be invested in marine conservation. So that was the debt swap. When we did the debt swap, it actually created awareness among environmentally conscious investors that there is an opportunity to do something maybe a bit more. And this is where we started conversations about a bond issuance. And we have created the space through the debt swap, uh, whereby, because obviously external debt is treated as differently from domestic debt, so even though when we bought back the debt, we still had this debt, it was domestic debt. So we had, dramatic, we had, quite, we had reduced our debt, our external debt by almost 30 million, which was relatively substantial. So it created that interest in doing a blue bond. But again, if we were to do a blue bond just classically going to the market, unfortunately, countries are not necessarily rewarded for the environmental benefit of green and blue bonds. And there is the unfortunate fact as well that African countries are often painted with the are painted with this very broad brush and are seen as risky. And of course, there are elements of risk which are higher in Africa. There is a certain amount of political risk, we all know. There is a certain amount of environmental risk, we all know. But there is also a part of the risk which is difficult to define because you only have to look at the rating agencies where often African countries that are similarly rated to, country, to countries from other regions, but they still pay higher a price. Partly there's the effect of scale as well, which I already mentioned. So in terms of Seychelles blue bond issuances, we realized that if we were going to get an affordable rate, we needed to have some form of partnership, and we engaged with the World Bank. And the World Bank uh, worked with us over, it took us about one and a half years to actually reach the point where we were ready to issue a bond. The important thing I would say also about a bond issuance is to be very clear on what you want to achieve. So therefore, the use of proceeds, which often comes later, it's very important to think about it right at the start and to build capacity right from the start. Particularly if you want it to have a high impact in vulnerable populations, because vulnerable populations are not bankable by definition. And therefore, if you really wanted to reach those people, you have to be from the start thinking about how you're going to build that capacity. In Seychelles, our goal was to create more affordable finance for what we call the semi-industrial fishermen, uh, on the fishing communities who, are, who have a little bit of capacity, but they are not at the industrial scale. Some of them may be able to have uh, some cold storage on board their vessels, meaning they can go for more than one day, but the majority of them are artisanal vessels that are catching fish and selling them the same day with limited ability to store the fish or process it, again, because of lack of cold storage, for example. And they are very much at the mercy of the prices which are given by the, the merchants and the, the, the fishmongers and the, the other processes. So the idea was that we create a blue bond that we can on lend, that these fishermen could invest in upscaling their capacity 
improve their participation in the value chain. For example, by having more cold storage facilities, they would be less desperate on having to sell fish the same day, for example. And the fish that they were unable to sell the same day, they could perhaps store for sale on another day or store for also other types of processing, using in pet food, for example, but in any case, getting less losses from their, from their catch. So in terms of the, the, the way we structured the bond was we, we channeled the proceeds through the Development Bank of Seychelles. So the bond was actually a sovereign bond, so meaning it was issued by the Republic of Seychelles on the international market. Uh, we got, because we benefited from the partial guarantee of the World Bank, uh, we got a very, very low rate because the World Bank is the highest rated institution you can have. So for people who are looking to buy the bond, they saw it as very credible. And we got an interest rate of below 2% for, for the bond, which meant we could on lend at just over 3% through the Development Bank of Seychelles after they put on their costs. There are, there are a number of, of successful loans that have been issued under this bond, but uh, the, there is a problem of uptake because of this, precisely this problem, as I said, of capacity to absorb uh, the funds. And for these operators who are often not having movable assets, are not having uh, fixed assets, are not having many things that they can put as collateral, and so the challenge of, of really working with those, uh, those partners. Now, alongside the blue bond, we also uh, actually mobilized some, uh, some uh, grant assistance, partly which came from the GEF uh, and partly which came from the World Bank itself, which was also aimed at supporting the sustainability of the fisheries. So it was looking at the management of the fisheries, the, what types of uh, fish were under pressure, and having management plans that would address those stocks that were at risk. So the success of the bond was in marrying the commercial need in the small and medium enterprise segment with the conservation need on certain at-risk species and linking that with the wider marine conservation efforts with a view to improving the value chain on fisheries. So I think in the context of Rwanda undertaking a bond, uh, firstly, from the time that I've been here, there's a lot of extremely interesting projects that are being done and a lot of which merit that type of financing. I think there's no point in hiding the reality that doing a, an SDG linked bond or a green bond is, can be very administratively burdensome. And often it can feel that the reward is not worth the, all of the administrative, uh, I would say, headaches that go with it. But I think with the right support, and there is increasingly announcements that have been made by the European Union, for example, under their Global Gateway Initiative, that there is about 40 billion US dollars available as guarantees, as partial guarantees, precisely for this kind of blending. So there would be opportunities, I think, to further build uh, this, these elements. But I think the focus areas have to be around capacity building uh, and to make sure that there is capacity within country uh, for the management of the, of the bond issuance process from the level of institutions, at the level of uh, ministries and, and uh, government agencies, and capacity building as well for the uptake if you're going to go for on lending. Uh, those are perhaps some of the elements that I would mention, and I will just end by uh, emphasizing the role that the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa is playing. Uh, we are supporting a few countries to undertake debt swaps, like Seychelles did in 2015. We are working currently with Cabo Verde, for example. Uh, we have looked at uh, Rwanda, but Rwanda has very little commercial debt for the moment. So a debt swap really is valuable if you have commercial debt, because the interest is higher. If you have only concessional debt already, the value of a debt swap is less. But a blue bond can be very, a blue bond or a green bond can be very interesting because it mobilizes additional finance to what you can develop otherwise. And what is very interesting as well is it develops the local market for, uh, for uh, environmental or, or green instruments, which can be very useful going forward. And even there is an opportunity for secondary markets uh, in the future uh, creating the opportunity for investors, uh, particularly local investors, as, or, even though if perhaps in the first instance your primary target might be the uh, foreign investors. So the UNECA, we also offer some capacity support for uh, bond issuances, and we'd be, interesting to, we'd be interested to hear what are the specific needs of Rwanda, because we don't want to just uh, offer support, but without knowing where the support is needed the most, 
And so I'm very interested to hear uh, the thoughts, the questions that people have today. Thank you once again for inviting me. And of course, I'm open for any questions. Murak Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, description you just gave. I think you will hear a lot of, of challenges, a lot of opportunities that we meet. So we will be knocking at your door very often for as long as you're in Rwanda. So <laughs> get ready for that. I'm coming every six months. Awesome. Great. Great. So um, I don't know if anybody had a specific question for Mr. Adam or if you'd like to so maybe network with him afterwards. Feel free. So the next speaker uh, I would like to welcome is Mr. Jerry Ndaishimie uh, from Gura Wright, who will be able to talk to us as well. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask uh, the tech team to put up uh, the presentation, the slides. In the meantime, uh, my name is Jerry Ndeshimye, like um, they introduced. I'm the marketing and uh, PR officer at Guraride. For those who don't know Guraride, um, it's the beautiful yellow bicycles you've seen around town. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so to start, uh, Guraride is a public bike share transport system uh, committed uh, to the sustainability of micromobility. Uh, uh, in Africa, with Rwanda being our first entry point. So um, this is our success story. I'm going to share with you, with you our success story of a uh, five months period. So um, first we'll start with our goal and I'll briefly go through the business model and our strategy. And I'll uh, give you some num numbers and metrics on our operations and performance during those five, mi uh, five months. I'll also go through our milestones and pilot uh, statistics, uh, user data analytics, also what we're going to do next. And I'll also show you some of the members of our team. So our goal is to facilitate uh, the migration of transportation from fossil fuel-based uh, modes of transport to um, other non-pollutant uh, forms of mobility, um, create green jobs, and also cut down on CO2 emissions. Uh, which is going to lead towards a green economy. So why do we do this? Uh, we want to increase uh, the awareness uh, and also raise uh, the levels of eco-consciousness in Rwanda. Uh, we want to reduce the amount of um, uh, in, uh, internal combustion engines, vehicles on the streets of Rwanda. We also have um, to lower the footprint, the carbon footprint, uh, whereby we have a goal of achieving a um, reduction of 2.62 carbon metric tons in Rwanda. Um, we also provide means of transportation. We want to uh, provide a fourth medium of transportation, adding to what we have currently, uh, which is private vehicles, public transport by bus, and also motor motorcycles, uh, which is regular and commonly used in Rwanda. So our business model, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what happened there, so I'll just go through it. Um, our business model has um, about five components. Um, what we do is we promote green transport, we promote women, uh, we also partner with different ed education institutions in Rwanda to uh, provide uh, green jobs and also um, provide uh, knowledge about green mobility. As we know, uh, public bike share schemes and also um, uh, um, green mobility is relatively new in Rwanda. So we don't have that many technicians who can handle electric bicycles. We don't have that many people uh, who know uh, the technical aspect of uh, green mobility and also public bike share systems. So uh, one of the things we've done is to um, integrate um, a learning uh, model in our business uh, model where um, we have partnerships through WDA. We partner with IPRC. We take students from, uh, uh, from their institutions. We train them. Uh, for example, all our bicycles and assets are assembled here in Rwanda. So we teach people how to assemble, te technicians, how to repair, and also um, um, uh, uh, how to um, 
operate generally um, any immobility vehicle around town. So um, we've started this period uh, with a business model. We wanted to raise awareness because um, no one really understood what a public bike share system is. Okay, um, so um, yeah, no one really knew uh, a public uh, bike share system is, so we had to teach people what it is actually they have on their hand at, uh, at this moment. So what we did is run a five month free ridership period. So um, I'll go through our statistics, how it went. Okay, so we've had 12,600 plus downloads, uh, whereby um, 100 bicycles was displayed uh, on 18 docking station around, uh, around town. Uh, we had uh, two corridors. Uh, Central Business District, and also the Remera KG17 uh, access, uh, whereby we had 14, uh, 14,600, uh, no, 47,840 rides uh, in total during the five months period, and also uh, where we average of uh, 320 rides per day. So um, I'll be glad to go through, uh, I'm being told my time is over. I'll be glad to go through a Q&A or interact with everyone to give you more details about the Grorad story. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jerry. So um, without further ado, I don't know if anyone wants a refill, juice, wine, or anything. It's the time as we're about to start the panel. So today's... Uh, panel discussion is about sustainable financing for a green economy. So for the non-finance people in the room and the non-climate people in the room, basically when we talk about a green economy, we're talking about economic growth that is directly linked to an environment conscience. So when we talk about sustainable finance in simple terms, we're saying how to make sure the investment and the money goes into projects that are green, or that I have that conscious as well. So I'd like to welcome our panelists. The first person is Thierry, who's uh, the advisor to the Ministry of State at Minecofin. I'd like to welcome Francine, who's a member of the private sector and founder of Muniax Eco. I'd like to invite Natalie, who's a climate finance specialist at Fonergua, also known as the Rwanda Green Fund. And last but not least, I'd like to invite Alida, my colleague from BRD, who's the energy portfolio manager. So we'll go directly to the questions. The first question goes to you, Thierry. And uh, no pressure, it's just that. <laughs> it's not working? No. I, uh, I don't think so. One, two, one, two. Ah, oh, yeah, it's working. <laughs> just need to be very close, close. To, the, to the mic. Give you mine. Yeah, maybe it's easier, no? It's easier, okay. Yeah. So why does the government of Rwanda care so much about the green economy? Thank you, Diana, for the question. Why do we care about the green economy? So the first question is, what is a green economy? Uh, the definition of the UNEP is that the green economy is a low carbon, resource efficient, and socially responsible economy. So for example, in a green economy, economic activities would invest into services that lower the risk of GHG emission, enhance the energy sources, and at the end, just protect the biodiversity and the environment. Uh, why do we care about the green economy? First, it's part of our nst ones so the, the National Strategy for Transformation of Rwanda, uh, under the economic transformation pillar. Uh, we have uh, the goal of accelerating private sector-led economic growth in a sustainable manner by protecting and at the same time protecting the environment and the ecosystem. Secondly, Rwanda is a vulnerable country as you know. 
climate change does impact us. According to REMA, we had in uh, 2018 200 million USD of damages. And on top of that, the economic impact assessed still by REMA was 1% of the GDP, only on the climate change. So from a pure economic point of view, uh, we need to mitigate those risks. Um, and for that, we needed to identify the kind of risk we had. So about climate change, when you think about it, you have the direct impact and the indirect impact. Direct impacts is what you would see or read in the, the media, in the New Times uh, articles. Floods, heavy rains, crop damages, road destructed, sometimes even people killed by, by those landslides, which is terrible. And in a second time, you would have the indirect impacts. Uh, and from a, an economic point of view, it would be a macroeconomic impact. So you may have heard that inflation is coming this year. That's the first yeah. impact that we have. Uh, the second one would be the debt post-COVID and to finance our climate transition. And last but not least, the depletion of our natural capital. So for inflation, as you all know, uh, we're experiencing quite a huge inflation. In January 2022, we had a 4.3% inflation compared to December uh, 2021. So in one month, it's quite substan substantial. Uh, what drives the, the, the inflation? Uh, two particular sectors, the food and the energy. So if you take just the vegetable in Rwanda, it increased by 11% in one month. So for vulnerable people, Jean-Paul Adam was talking about, it's, it's very difficult. 11% in one month. Uh, what caused that? Mainly uh, the floods and the landslide and the destruction of the crop. And since the crop were destructed, the farmers were obliged to increase their price. Um, so you have the, the food part and you have as well the energy part. As you all know, uh, linked to the tensions that we have in Europe on gas and fuel, we had uh, uh, what we call an imported inflation coming from Europe and hitting Rwanda. Uh, so what has the government done? The government has stepped in and subsi uh, uh, put subsidies in public transportation and fuel prices. But it's not, uh, uh, it cannot last forever, right? And it has a, a cost. Uh, that was the first uh, solution done by the government. And so in a second time, BNR, the national bank increased the key repo rate from 4.5% to 5%. So what does it mean uh, for those who, who are not familiar with finance? It's a signal to the market and to the banks to say, okay, the repo rate is, is increasing, so you need to curb your lending to the people. And by curbing the lending to people, you reduce the liquidity. And by that, you fight inflation. Um, so we had those, those two solutions that we've inputted, but when you think about green economy, you, you could have thought about our food. If we were to improve our adaptation uh, about the energy, if we were to have more uh, uh, green energies, we, we could have fought naturally this inflation. And it has a cost uh, uh, on our debt as well. So this was my second part of the, the, the indirect consequences. Uh, we're in uh, what we call, in financial uh, terms, a fiscal consolidation period. What does it mean? It means that the debt burden is high. When you go, we went out of COVID, our debt exploded. We were far from the Seychelles 150%, but still, in uh, 2021, our debt uh, to GDP ratio was 72%, which is still uh, uh, big. And at the same time, we had a deficit of 8.9%. Uh, and part of the dis this deficit, in, in this deficit, you have 3% only that comes from COVID-19. Just vaccinating people and building uh, uh, our facilities. So we're in, in, in this indebtment period, and we need to be very careful with how we use our debt. And that's as well... Uh, something to take into account when we discuss the green uh, bond. We need a very concessional 
very, very concessional loan. Um, and with that, we have the challenge uh, coming from the environment. When we discuss with Fonerroi, with MOE, uh, they would come to us and say, okay, we need to finance the transition, there are green projects. And so in the Ministry of Finance, we need to think how do we finance those projects uh, concessionally. So that's why in Minecofin we decided to uh, green the national planning using concepts such as uh, green tagging, green budgeting, green spending review. Uh, what those big words mean is just taking all the projects, national projects we have, and assess how green it is, and if it's not green, how, how can we green it? Once we've done that, we can unlock the climate finance, which is supposedly uh, uh, more concessional, and finance our transition in a very sustainable and cheap way. And finally, uh, just to conclude on our uh, natural capital accounting, um, in Minecofin we decided as well to take into account a new KPI for our economy. Currently, if you look at the GDP, it does not take into account the, the depletion of natural capital accounting. Uh, it's only look at the economic performance, like the income. But at the same time, the, 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 the asset depletion is, in, is in invisibilized. If you take, for example, uh, a company that would, uh, that would use m minerals in an unsustainable manner, or a fishery company that would over exploit the, 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 the water resources, it would have a cost right on our assets. If you, we look in our GDP, in, uh, in our ministry, we don't see it. So we decided to change the way we, we calculate uh, and monitor our macroeconomy and uh, environment and start to take into account the natural capital accounting, like the depletion of our natural capital. And for that, uh, we are currently working with uh, different partners on defining an environmentally adjusted net domestic product. So what is it? It's just the net do domestic product minus the natural capital uh, depletion. And with that, if you add uh, uh, the, the the, the, the other, other externalities, you can arrive to what we call a green or sustainable GDP, depending on where you are. And it will enable us at a macroeconomic level to uh, monitor and take into account our uh, economic performance by looking at the environmental impact. So that's grossly what we've been doing. I hope it answers questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thierry. So basically, I think one, one of the, the messages you just gave is to every Rwandan is if we don't start thinking about the climate, it will directly affect the food on our plates. So we need to think about it. Because often we think of damages, landslides, but we don't necessarily see, if, especially if you're in a nice building like this, you don't necessarily see how it's going to affect the food you're going to eat tomorrow. So thank you very much for that. So Francine, welcome again. Thank you. As a member of the private sector, um, you meet, I'm sure, different challenges. And uh, my question will be, what are the key challenges and funding needs of the private uh, sector in contributing to Rwanda's green economy, as, since it is part of our strategy? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the thing is that, uh, uh, our company is in uh, solar energy, renewable energy, so we are already in the green sector. And still, it's, as you said, it's, we have huge challenge, and I'm, I'm looking at uh, my dear friend from VRD because we have been discussing, even we start the discussion even before the meeting, very uh, interesting exchange. And uh, the feeling we have when we, we discuss and when we interact with financing institutions, not only BRD but, but all the others, is that the, the risk for them, it's really, they have a very high aversion to risk. It's, uh, when we are talking to them, it is, you are too risky. We, we, will not, we, we need to be risked. We need to do that. But they don't have the means, maybe that's the way I, feel, I, I, I see that, uh, they don't have the means uh, to the risk. So 
the thing is that they will ask you collateral, 130% collaterals, and they will ask you high interest rate, and they will really uh, check on you very deeply uh, to see how they can minimize the, their risk, which, which is very good to be adverse to risk, but at a certain stage, we need to take the risk together. And uh, we have the feeling that the bank are not ready to take the, the, the risk we, with us. Uh, why? Maybe they have their own constraints. I, I can understand that they have their own constraints. And we really need to, to find ways to see how um, we can work together, knowing that we take some risk and the banks can take risks. But definitely, this, is, this might be a discussion uh, at uh, 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 a different stage, uh, because uh, we, we, we feel that we are blocked at a certain stage because of all the constraints linked to the uh, sector bancaire. I do say that the bank, the, the bank sector here, and which makes when you go to the se second picture, we, we makes us the f uh, to, to see that there is a lot of money from our point of view, available money. But we are there and we cannot reach that. That's because of this high perception of, of risk and this high collateral. Because the collateral might not be correspond to the needs that we have. And then we are blocked because, because of that. And <laughs> we are having a lot of frustration. We were talking even with BRD about our frustration. And because we see that there is money, but we cannot access it. Despite the fact that we are a successful company, and we are developing our activities, we have an impact on environment impact, but not only uh, in our company, we, we, we are very sensitive to gender, uh, myself being a, a woman, and also in a male dominated sector when we really want to give 50% uh, of the job to ladies, so it's a big effort that we are doing, despite not having finance, but, but also uh, doing capacity building. Another point, when you see the nice pictures there, uh, the, the third one, where you have foreign companies and we, we have local companies. And that's why there is also the big, the, 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 the big challenge. Green economy, green energy uh, has been uh, tackled by foreign companies and they come with a lot of finance, they come with grants, they come with subsidized loan, they come with even uh, technical assistance, they are pushed by their countries, uh, Europe, US, China, whatever, to come and to do business. And we like competitions, we love competition because we can uh, improve our way to do business. The challenge is that with this kind of uh, financing that they are getting, the competition becomes unfair, and then we are really lost, and we cannot really function uh, the way we want, as we, we have our cost of money is much higher, and it's much more difficult to get. So definitely, this is a, a really huge challenge for us to have unfair competition, which can really uh, make us staying small, and not being able to extend and not benefiting from economic of economy of scales and then slowly slowly die <laughs> that's the the reality we we are facing and this reality which is we that we are facing no enough financing uh, or very difficult access to finance make us very when you see the the, the fourth picture that you want to to go forward but you are being back yeah. So, because of that, we lose, uh, we lose uh, a lot of things. We lose our income, our revenue, uh, we lose creation of job. If we would have access to finance since now, we have been asking since two or three years uh, ago, if we would have get what we wanted, we would have created more than one other job up to now. Now we are only 23 in our company. And the, this reality is not only mine, it's the reality of many other uh, what, what we say in the engineers company who really want to extend in their own country or extend outside the country. Very important, we, we cannot extend as we want in the country and outside despite the fact that we have um, a lot of potentiality with this Africa free trade area and we will see and we are seeing even now <laughs> that foreigners can benefit, foreign companies can benefit much more from this 
possibilities in, in the country, outside the country, extending and extended, extending their, their activities, sorry, sometimes English is difficult, <laughs> yeah. extending their activities and limited, limiting hours. I don't want to look as a, like a, a victim, but that's the reality we are facing. And despite this reality, I can tell you that we managed even in 2021 to double our uh, revenue, despite all of that. Because we work hard, we try to be creative. We replace the lack of money by creativity. But at the end, we still need more money to extend, to develop our activities, to have a better impact, to create jobs and also to have uh, an impact on the environment and to really be part of this nice challenge of reducing the impact of climate change. And this is why very important for us to break this uh, challenge of access to finance. If you allow me, I have some solution, and maybe that was not the questions. Was it no, the we question? welcome solutions. We welcome solutions. Go ahead. Yes, OK. Thank you. Uh, some solutions is not rocket science. It's, uh, you know, the, the, the system of collateral that we are, we are being asked, we have been uh, asked uh, to have, most of the time it's linked to uh, a house, a vehicle, or assets, okay? Uh, in other countries, we know that the collateral is more the business model. It's more the business plan, it's more the projections. And if we can put more emphasis on that, the collateral is really the idea of the entrepreneurs, the business plan, the projections, the, the team, the leadership, the team, uh, all what makes really a, a business a successful and, and, and uh, profitable, uh, we need really to take into account on that. Another point, of course, it's blended finance. This is not new. I think some of us have mentioned it. It's also uh, access to grant, like the foreign companies, so we are able also to, to really challenge them. Up to now, we haven't received any grant for us as Muniac Seco, but still we managed to do something. So let's see how we can push, even if we don't have grant, but we have subsidized loan. This already, it's a big, uh, it's a big, uh, yes, she said that I have, I'm taking too much time. And to, <laughs> to, 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 finish, to finish that, I think it's uh, maybe to have a kind of uh, a get together. And we were talking about that with Alida uh, before from BRD, really to discuss, uh, to sit down and to discuss how we can improve the access to finance to all of us, not only to us, as Muniac Seco, as a company Muniac Seco, but all these indigenous companies who are battling uh, uh, and who try really uh, to be profitable and to make an impact in their country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francine. I think you have spoken for many. <laughs> and, and, and we, I mean, as, as, as part of BRD, we know we keep, we keep listening to the private sector and we hear you and we, we work, we're working towards making, making it easier for, for you all. So I think, uh, well, you did mention the high risk aversions, the collateral issues and the high interest, which basically makes you unable to compete and to be competitive. And I think inevitably to, you know, to contribute to the green economy. So thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. I'd like to welcome Nathalie. Nathalie from Fonelgua, also known as the Green Fund. So um, the question to Fonelgua and to you, Nathalie, is what are the key challenges and opportunities in the green sector? Hello. <laughs> All right, I think we can, um, perhaps it will be easier to use the mic. I hope that's the right way. Go to it's Perfect. Um, so in terms of, uh, of the challenges, I think Francine has done a very good job exposing the extent to which um, the, the, the private sector is really is struggling on this front. Uh, and, and I want you to know that you are heard. Uh, and um, if, if I'm to briefly introduce the fund, 
so Fonehua, uh, the, the Rwanda Green Fund, is a national fund for, for climate change and, and the environment. It has been operational for about uh, eight, nine years now. Uh, we've been able to mobilize uh, over 217 million and have supported 45 projects. But where uh, I'm obviously going to agree with you is that unfortunately only about 6% uh, of our total commitments have gone to the private sector. And this is, this is a failure on our part. It's, uh, uh, it's definitely a KPI of concern and, and one that we have, put, uh, we have put a lot of time in trying to understand uh, and, and solution for. So uh, in, in, in terms of solutioning for it, um, we have conducted a market assessment which has revealed all of the challenges uh, that you have stated so far. Uh, uh, high risk perception, there's an existing high cost of, uh, of finance, but the, the high risk feeds into that as well. Um, there's a high collateral requirement, uh, which is also fed by the high risk. Uh, lack of project finance, lack of long-term finance, which renders um, our, our domestic um, entrepreneurs also less competitive. So everything that you have stated uh, has also been reflected in, uh, in our studies. And, and, and part of the work that we're doing is in solutioning and developing tailored products to answer that. Um, so in terms of the challenge, <laughs> uh, that goes to the private sector. Now, if I'm to, to paint a, big of a, a bit of a larger picture, um, in, in 2009, there was an estimated, there was a study quantifying the impact of climate change on our economy, which stated about 1%, 1% of our GDP is lost per year uh, by the year 2013. Uh, and th this is quite significant. Um, and, and, and this has led to uh, the development of our green growth and climate resilience strategy um, to mainstream and develop programs uh, to ensure that Rwanda can become uh, a climate resilient um, nation by 2050. Uh, and it has also been integrated into our vision 2050. And recently in May 2020, Rwanda has submitted um, a revised uh, national determined contribution, essentially a climate action plan responding uh, to the Paris Agreement. And so we have committed to a 38% emission reduction uh, by the year 2030. And so the activities uh, um, within our climate action plan split between mitigation and adaptation are costed at about $11 billion. So, there's a lot of opportunity here, be it at the, for the private sector, for the civil society, uh, and naturally for the public sector. Uh, and it is also a lot of homework on our part um, to be able to ensure that we're developing the right mechanism while blending uh, the financing to allow certain uh, areas to be deserved uh, adequately. Uh, and so, um, this kind of financing, not, so I've, as I've mentioned, we've been operational for nine years. We've done a, a great job, if I may say, mobilizing about 217 million in grant. But uh, given the, the new goals here, uh, it is clearly not achievable in, in grant financing alone. So how do we uh, ensure uh, that we, how do we use um, public capital to leverage and public finance to leverage private capital to be able to meet our, our climate goals. So uh, again, a key component of our mandate is to promote and support the private sector. Uh, we intend to, to support this at a ratio of about 30%. I've mentioned how inadequately we're doing this so far. Uh, the challenges which Francine has stated. Um, so in order to address this, we are currently uh, developing uh, new programs, new mechanisms, new financial instruments. So we are currently working with the Development Bank of Rwanda. <laughs> and I see that Zaina has uh, set us together uh, for this specific purpose. Um, so 
the, um, the platform or the mechanism or the framework through which we want to deliver this to you um, is through the Rwanda Green Investment Facility. So this is looking to provide a certain level of subsidy uh, for, for the debt financing we're providing. Uh, green guarantees, again, to address <laughs> the, the very high collateral requirements. Uh, we're also looking to green leasing uh, to, to a certain extent complement uh, also the kind of products, products you're delivering but now working on, uh, on your core market. Um, but also to support all of this and the innovation needed for Rwanda to leapfrog to a green economy, we are working to, we have established a green incubator and accelerator program. Uh, we have uh, a first pilot of 10 incubatees, great projects. Uh, there's a great deal of innovation. Um, and so we want to let the private sector know that there's opportunity here, both on, on the project preparatory side, but there's also financing coming. <laughs> Uh, this financing available, we're working uh, to definitely uh, develop uh, tailor-made solutions for you. And uh, I would like to thank BRD very much for creating this platform. I hope this conversation will be one of many. Um, to, uh, this is being developed for you, and so that exchange uh, has to be done where now perhaps the next stage will be more listening than talking. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much, Nathalie. Clearly, you're working very hard to solve Francine's <laughs> issues, and we appreciate, we appreciate that a lot. But she has to be quick. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the platform is yeah. here. The, the message is direct. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. So last but not least, um, Alida from BRD. Uh, as part of, a, of the only development bank of Rwanda, what do you think is the role of BRD in securing and providing sustainable financing for a green economy. Thank you very much, Zaina. And uh, thank you very much, because uh, you've uh, mentioned uh, part of what I was going to, uh, uh, again, explain on what we are doing as BRD to support the sustainable uh, financing, but also address some of the challenges of uh, Francine. So, uh, in terms of BRD, um, I would say that uh, what, we, what we are currently doing, uh, I would uh, categorize them in those five items, where um, definitely we would be uh, sourcing and mobilizing funds for, for long-term uh, green financing. And uh, Francine, you've mentioned that uh, uh, the cost of financing is very high. I, s I think you can see that we've taken into consideration, we've heard you. So uh, one of the things that we are currently doing as a development bank is to ensure that we source low-cost credit or low-cost financing so that we are, we, you are also able as a, a private company to benefit from this kind of funds. And these uh, funds can be accessed through uh, direct lending, meaning uh, a company accessing loan from BRD, but also through uh, commercial banks, because obviously we are not only looking at the companies, but also the whole value chain, uh, including uh, the, the, the private institution as well. But also we can even refinance some of the projects uh, uh, which were executed. So uh, on the solution that you had provided, uh, it included uh, blended uh, financing. We've thought of it as well. As you can see, we, we try to engage in collaboration with uh, different institutions, uh, such as Fonera, where we could get subsidy uh, to subsidize some of the funds, uh, the, the, the funds on interest rate that we give, but also provide uh, um, grants uh, where applicable. So, uh, for example, maybe uh, currently BRID has a, a project in the renewable energy, uh, which basically focuses on electrification. And uh, through this program, we are able to not only to access financing, but also uh, receive subsidy, claim the subsidy once you've uh, executed or implemented the project. 
So uh, in addition to that, obviously, uh, we, we, we are trying to position ourselves as a knowledge hub when it comes to green financing, because uh, one of the challenges that uh, Francine mentioned, uh, she mentioned to, uh, this perspective, uh, perspective that uh, green financing is very risky. So uh, the way we are trying to address this is uh, through uh, capacity building, not only uh, for companies, but also uh, the financial sector as a whole, because uh, we really want to, uh, uh, to have a common understanding when it comes to green financing, but also uh, 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 providing tools and templates that may assist uh, not only us, but also any other um, involved institution. So in addition, uh, I would like to mention that we also are looking at the, the risking instrument, Francine. <laughs> well, we work with uh, different partners uh, in trying to avail uh, a guarantee fund, which would, uh, again, de-risk the transaction, although it won't be 100%. This is what we have now, but definitely it's something that, that we can, uh, again, discuss with other, other uh, development institutions to see uh, how we can avail those kind uh, of uh, instruments. So uh, maybe lastly, uh, obviously, if we want uh, our economy to be, to be green, we also need to uh, take into consideration the integration of uh, environmental and social consideration into our lending uh, decision, because uh, at the end of the day, it will affect us. So we really need to take into consideration and not uh, ignore that. So uh, I would say that for now. Thank you. <laughs> I think Francine has something to add to your yes. point real quick. Just a question about the collateral. <laughs> what will you do with the collateral? What kind of collateral you will ask? So, uh, through the Knowledge Hub, what we'll do, we'll try to sit with different uh, investors to first of all try and understand the project. Again, uh, since we are on the, I would say both, uh, we are the middleman between the, uh, the investment company and the bank, Try to understand the project, the project and then maybe design it in the way that will fit the bank's need, but also will not, again, constrain you from accessing funding. And this can be done through accessing the risking instrument that are already existing, but also considering uh, other collaterals uh, which are not physical land or physical uh, uh, properties. Uh, also considering uh, in terms of uh, the project, the receivables, all, all those areas that we can consider when looking at the uh, financing a project. But it's into discussion. <laughs> yeah. Think across then. No? I hope that it will be done. Yeah. I, no, can, it's confirm, very good. I yeah. can confirm yeah. that those discussions are ongoing on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm always working yeah. with these two to yeah. find those solutions. Yeah, okay. so. <laughs> Yeah, j just a small remark yes, on my ahead. side. Uh, in the Africa Sustainable Development Forum, we assisted last week with uh, Jean-Paul. There was this concept, very interesting, of movable collateral registry, mm -hmm. which would take into account livestock, tractors for farmers, and uh, anything else as a collateral to, uh, uh, to encourage, actually, uh, the lending to, to vulnerable people. So it's something uh, that we're starting thinking of. Yes, go ahead. Yes, firstly, to say that this is a problem in all countries, right? Even countries that have got past it, it was a problem at some point. Uh, and there's the issues around, firstly, the laws in the country, which I'm not too sure what the laws provide in, in Rwanda. I think you're very much looking in the right direction because you're trying, it's solution orientated. And there are solutions like these uh, uh, movable collateral that, that are possible. Uh, the, the link with contracts as well, because sometimes uh, an entrepreneur, if you're in solar, you may have an advance order, uh, for example, uh, and this can also be, be sometimes used as, as collateral along with all the other de-risking elements. The only point that I will add, and I know this will be unpopular, uh, is that we do need to understand that banks have to be risk of because the Precisely, we've seen problems that have happened before where banks become decoupled from, their lending is decoupled from the reality of the risk. So, the, and particularly in developing countries, we have to be careful. Uh, but 
yes, using all of these different mechanisms, we have to make money. Money is actually flowing to the people who need it, particularly in sector, for example, solar, uh, solar panels. If you can domesticate elements of the production, the multipliers are actually very, very high, particularly in the first phase. A lot of studies that EC have done, not necessarily in Rwanda, but in other countries, have shown that if you can get your value chain aligned on uh, the production of renewable energy around solar panels, you, you actually get a huge multiplier effect in terms of job creation and the uh, value-added effect within the economy. Thank you very much. And I think this platform is very interesting in, in, in sharing the policies that other countries have and what has worked so that we can actually learn from that and also get it to, to, to where it can be implemented. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we can actually take a few questions. If there's questions in the audience, feel free. You can let us know and uh, we'll pass the microphone around. Every question is a valid question. It was super clear. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. I have a question before. When, when will you apply this new, uh, what you have presented? It's for when? We because will. you didn't mention that. Mention. Is it next year, this year, in two years? So uh, we are, we, it's in the process. I wouldn't say that it's next year, but it's within this year. And it? It's in the process. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Thank you. But we appreciate the level of urgency. <laughs> <That's it>. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's right to be urgent because my question is also has to do with business, the business of conservation, right? Um, so one thing the School of Wildlife and Conservation at ALU has been studying is essentially the business of conservation and not essentially just thinking about renewable energy, which, yeah, it's great, um, but really conservation overall, right? I think over 1.95 US billion in US dollars is lost in illicit trade in marine, um, in the marine economy, right? So Monsieur Adam here has invested in marine <laughs> economy and, and trying to protect it. Um, however, that's been proven over you know, however long conservation has been going on, that it's not effective. If you're going to start thinking about how to protect our world, you have to think about it through business. You have to think about how do you privatize and do you push people to start creating businesses around conservation. I mean, South Africa makes over $56 million in game meat. Just the meat, not the hunting, not the permits, just the meat. I mean. I am, I love animals, I will be the last person to kill an animal, but I also understand that that creates jobs, it creates money, it helps um, the people around those game lodges because one, they have, um, they can use their practices that they've used for generations on end hunting to teach, um, to teach tourists how to hunt effectively, and you're also limiting the power of, of, um, of uh, braconnage, how do you say that in English? I'm forgetting, poaching, right? Yeah. Uh, because now poachers cannot poach anymore because you know what, you can get a permit, it's, it's expensive, it's $1,500, but you could go hunt your own lion <laughs> and that's bringing money into the economy. So my question goes to Minikofin, right? Have you thought about pushing Rwandans to start thinking about the business of conservation, not just in terms of the you know uh, climate because yeah climate everyone is doing that but really are you thinking about how do we protect our our birds how do we you know work with Akagera to create maybe game lodges so that people can come hunting and create other economy f economical factors within the country and in our portfolio as a country right so that's my question. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a very good question. Thierry, over here. Go ahead. Thank you, Zaina. Yeah, th that's a, a very interesting question, but I would answer your question by a question. <laughs> <laughs> very, in a very political way. <laughs> so you say that hunting a lion, you can have a license of 2,500, for example, uh, dollar, and it gives money to, to, to the economy, brings money into the economy, but What's the value of a lion? So, the value of a lion, right? Yeah. Um, I think in this case, 
Thank you. So in this case, right, in South Africa, they're not necessarily thinking about the value of a lion, but they're thinking of the value of their wild lions versus the domesticated ones that you get in a game lodge. So instead of having issues with poachers and issues with, you know, their national parks, Kruger having to fight all of that, they're thinking, hey, we could have X amounts of domesticated lions. I mean, I already know that Akagura has been having a great time with lion population. They've been exploding. <laughs> and eventually we're gonna have to start thinking about how Absolutely. to curb them, right? Um, because they're gonna be affecting um, the population around the park, right? Um, and the livestock. So how, you know, instead of either curbing those population, let's have X amounts of lion into a game lodge. And then everyone, you know, a lot of people I know in the US are really interested in hunting. So, you know, give out a permit, hunt those lions, and that is a cost that we're losing in terms of animals, yes, but it is also one that is protecting the others that are wild, not domesticated, and also helping the communities, right? Um, and and, and these, are, these, are, these are very um, problematic <laughs> um, ways of thinking, about, of, of, of thinking about the wildlife economy, but it is also things that we have to ask ourselves, right? How many elephants in Tanzania are gonna get hunted versus if we had game lodges in Tanzania and could hunt an elephant legally, how many would be protected within the actual wild ones, right? Yeah, yeah. The, well, I, I'll rep uh, reply just personally, not as the name of as Minikofin, but it's a bit fatalistic the way you see things. Because in, in my way of thinking things, we're investing into uh, Akagera, we're investing, for example, in the Volcano Park, which will extend and we'll have more tourists just to visit the gorillas, you know, the price of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, instead of thinking about how we can kill those animals and get money, what about thinking about how we can visit those animals in their natural habitat and get money from that? Yes. The ecotourism in Rwanda is one of the first uh, revenue uh, of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take into account the, the issue that Africa has about resource uh, um, a domestic resource mobilization, we have the, 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 the chance in Rwanda to have ecotourism that's very developed. If you look at yeah, one agree. PSG game, you will see visit Rwanda. Yeah. So we're more into this ideology, yeah. actually with RDB and Minikofin rather than the other. Yeah, I agree, but you know, COVID happened. What happened when COVID happened? Planes stopped coming, people stopped doing photo tourism. That is actually a problem that Kenya had to face because they essentially made their wildlife economy all about phototourism. What happens when you do not have a portfolio that's big enough to cover different crazy things that are gonna happen? Because you know what, COVID is not a one thing that's only gonna happen in 2020. Especially with climate change, we're gonna keep having a lot of different variants and, and viruses that are going to com keep coming if we keep encroaching onto nature, right? So how do we think about, you know, phototourism? Yeah, phototourism is good. I told you I'm a pacifist, could never kill anything. But we have to start thinking about um, the expansion of the economy and also being able to protect our portfolio, essentially. Not just rely on one thing, because then Kenya had to pivot. They couldn't sustain themselves with phototourism. People around the park started hunting animals to survive. Now you have a problem, right? And so <laughs> these are the different things that um, I think should be thought about, and, and the business of conservation should be one thing that people really start thinking about. Thank you so much. That's a, that's a very good point, and I think Mr. Adam wants to, to yeah, complement Thierry I, as well. I have a little bit of experience because Seychelles is all about conservation uh, tourism. Uh, and the, but what I would say is that from the work that we've done at ECA, I think the models can be different in different countries. The focus has to be on how you get the resources to the most vulnerable populations. So if you go to a country, and, and so there'll be different phases, I think, in terms of the, the conservation degree that you, you take. Uh, I think Rwanda has been extremely successful in the model that, that, that they've used and has also been successful in actually transferring that income, both in terms of programs that government does and in terms of individuals. Now, the scope for doing more of that, um, obviously, there's always a risk. Tourism is very, is very linked to what happens in the global economy. And if it's not COVID, it's Ukraine. If it's not Ukraine, I mean, in Seychelles, 
we had this big issue in the early 2000s with the Gulf War. People stopped traveling. So you can't prevent, autom you can't prevent absolutely the external shocks. Uh, but if you go to the basis of what the need is, you can try to mitigate some of the risks. And I'll give you an example on the studies we did in DRC. So in DRC, one of the biggest risks is uh, people cutting trees for firewood. So any conservation tourism that, we, that anyone would try to do in DRC has to start with the aspect of, because that's the biggest threat to wildlife. It's not hunting, it's not poaching, it's actually loss of habitat. Mm -hmm. So you had, it has to start with the solution, which is clean cooking solutions. Yeah. And there are opportunities around the clean cooking solutions to create jobs. You can create, for example, you can situate in that area the manufacturing of clean cooking stoves, whether it's gas-based or whether it's using another fuel, but moving people away from the dependence on just charcoal. So you have to look at it from that perspective. How will you create an income at the level of the population? And then from there, you can build your, your conservation tourism, I think, going forward. But you do arrive at different models, and, and, and in the context of Seychelles around fisheries, the catch and release fisheries, you can some very sought after species, just for the license, you pay $10,000. And it's catch and release. Mm -hmm. That's just the license before you've paid your hotel and everything else. So, and I think that there are opportunities around that, but you need to look at what, where you, you need to do the value chain analysis, where you'll get the most return on investment. And certainly, parks and ecotourism are among the biggest multipliers. We did studies in, in uh, Kenya and South Africa that have a very developed uh, parks tourism aspect. The return on investment is 300%. It's very, very good. In DRC, where we did the same study, the impact is less because you're starting from a, a different base. It's still valuable, but you need to deal with it concurrently with the other resource stresses that exist at the population level. So you have to deal with those resource stresses and solve those, and you can do it by creating jobs at the same time. Thanks. If, Zain, if I could compliment, perhaps. Sure. Um, Just a bit, we're yeah. running a bit out of time, but uh, please do. But just, just a quick um, example of, of some of the things that Rwanda has done outside of the gorillas in the parks. So recently there has been a, a, a Fonera Rwanda Green Fund supported project to rehabilitate uh, a wetland in, in Nyandungu, which is, a, is an, in an urban area. Um, and and we, we're looking at a business model that would work so that we can also um, expand and, and scale these types of activities. So not only uh, can we create economic activity there, um, we, we must also be able to quantify the, uh, the ecosystem services that these types of habitats are providing. We are drawing in um, different types of tourists uh, who may be interested in something other than gorillas and, and, <laughs> and, and gamers. Um, <laughs> but uh, and, and, and lastly, I think it's also going to create beautiful areas for, uh, for Kigalians to be able to go play with their kids. So the whole element of wellness and, um, and, and livability uh, brought to the city, I think, is also part of the multiplying effect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Natalie. So uh, just maybe one or two quick questions and then we'll have to wrap up. All right, uh, ahead, thank you. Uh, so uh, my question goes to BRD. So uh, right, uh, we have been here for five years, but we started uh, officially in 2021. That's when the system started working uh, for the public. So w one of the problem that we've had is uh, acquiring financing, especially from VCs, uh, whereby when you sit down with VCs, uh, you end up seeing that people are leading you astray from uh, your vision and mission. So I was uh, going to ask, what are the types of financing available with BRD solution? And if so, um, what are the requirements behind this? And uh, uh, if a company or an entrepreneur is applying, um, does the requirement differ uh, depending on what type of financing they are looking for? Yeah, so that's my question. Has a question too. 
All right, um, I won't ask a question, right? Yeah, so my name is Alex. Uh, my question is for, I think, uh, Thierry and then um, shortly for Mr. John Paul. So it's about the KPI you mentioned that you added in the, GT, in the GDP, you know, to monitor the macroeconomic environment. Um, my question is, what's like the weighting of that KPI um, to the total performance of the GDP? So assuming you have like different KPIs you're looking at to provide, you know, the score, let's say, for the GDP, what's like the weighting um, of that uh, KPI that uh, it's basically monitoring the environment? Um, and then also to Mr. Jean Paul, it's more or less the same. So looking at um, nice the work you've been doing, let's say, like in Sea uh, Shields, and do you have such a, a similar KPI? And if not, what have you been uh, using to basically monitor the effect um, of the you know, disasters to environment um, towards the GDP? Thank you. Thank you. And I think Glenn also had, that will be our last question. Glenn, you have the honors. It's right there. It's right there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, my name is Glenn. I'm with UNDP. Um, <clears throat> I think really my question is, you know, um, who in the room is out of their mind? Because we keep hearing um, over and over, you know, this idea of uh, risk. You know, it's too risky. And so, you know, are the banks out of their mind or are the entrepreneurs out of their mind? <laughs> because I mean, I think with COVID, what any, everything has taught us is risk is highly subjective. You know, do I choose to wear a mask in this room today or not? It's really depending on a very subjective view of what the risk is. So I think it would be good to hear from you, like, are the banks out of their mind? And actually, this is a very lucrative space and there's a lot of money to be made in the green economy, but there's just not an, uh, a, an accurate uh, assessment of the risk. Or are entrepreneurs out of their mind to get into some of these businesses um, because it is very risky and, and with the current climate now, the current investment conditions of, of uh, a lot of capital flight to safety and higher, um, interest rate costs, et cetera, like, is this just a crazy market to be in? So what, what's correct? And, and, and then also what can BRD and Minecofin do to sort of provide um, investor information, you know, across the board that's kind of neutral to say like, here are the opportunities, here's the typical rate of return one can expect with these types of green projects. You know, <clears throat> and I think um, maybe some of that could be considered as well in the next phase of the, the work that you've um, been proposing through the RGIF, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. So I think we should start maybe with the first uh, question that was directed to Alida. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, in terms of uh, type of financing that we currently have as BRD, uh, I would say that we have different products, however, uh, I don't want to go into details, but when it comes to uh, uh, your project specifically, uh, we would want to hear from you more in terms of the project so that we design a product that is suitable for your project. Because uh, I might say that we can give you a term loan which might not be suited for your project. We might give you a uh, 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 working capital which might not suit your project. So we would like to hear more from your project and then based on that design a product uh, depending on how you want it to be structured. Because I said uh, we, we are trying to create a hub, a knowledge hub, where we, not, we not only understand the client's need but we also ensure that it fits into our, our model and we, we provide the, the, the right product when it comes to that. Thank you. Thank you, Alida. So I think, Jerry, that means you just got an appointment with her <laughs> for, to discuss further. I think uh, the other question was directed to Thierry. It was from uh, the gentleman. Uh, in uh, the yeah. it, it was about, uh, yeah, about the KPIs. Yeah, I had the squid game questions before. <laughs> no. Yeah, no. the easiest ones. <laughs> Now the, the, the question on, on the KPI, which is quite interesting actually. Thank you, Jean-Paul. Uh, Jean-Paul, I forgot your name. Alex. Um, yeah, actually, that's a difficult question. We need to measure natural capital. Um, we need to assess the value of the forest, assess the value of, for example, Kivu Lake, uh, the methane under Kivu Lake. Uh, there will be 
different methodologies per sector that will be followed. Um, for now, we have not defined yet uh, the strategy and the weight we'll put per sector. But at the end, the plan is to say, okay, we have our GDP and we have our uh, environmentally adjusted GDP, which is the GDP minus the uh, wealth depletion. And the, the methodology that which will be followed will be per sector uh, for forest, for soil erosion, for water, for fishery, etc., etc., to assess the value and how much do we lose and or how much do we get. But for now, it's not yet fully developed, so I cannot 100% uh, reply, but that will be the, the, the spirit and the methodology to monitor, to be able to monitor at a macro level uh, e even if we say, and you read in the media, oh, it's great, our GDP is a double digit uh, for next year, what about our environmentally adjusted GDP? Thanks. Thank you, Thierry. So, um, I think the last question, oh, he did uh, want to, Jean-Paul but go ahead. Thank you. I, I don't think I can answer much better than, than Thierry. I think he did a really good job. The, the whole problem is that it is hard uh, because the, the, essentially we measure GDP using metrics that are essentially designed by the World Bank, by the IMF. Uh, and those metrics prioritize economic growth uh, year on year. And therefore, anything that produces quick growth tends to be prioritized. And hence, there is a rush of capital towards things that bring quick returns. Nature brings fantastic returns, but it's long term. So the investment that you make tends to bring a, 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 takes longer for you to get a return, even if that return is actually better in terms of the multiplier effects. And certainly in the context of Seychelles, what we did, and it's, it's a small economy with very little natural resources, so it's a, you see it more directly, I would say, than perhaps in other economies. Uh, and an example was around the conservation of sea turtles. Traditionally, people ate sea turtles. They consumed them. But there was a point in around the 1980s where, you know, it was costed. The value of a live sea turtle was much more than one that could be sold for meat. And that point was reached around the 1980s when tourism started to grow. Uh, so there's now a law which protects uh, sea turtles. And the, uh, the value to tourism can more or less be quantified. Uh, in that context. The, the other element which is around natural capital, which is, which is what Thierry is pointing out, is that we don't understand sometimes, we don't see directly the value that certain uh, investments bring. And I think one of the main areas to illustrate might be around water. Um, I'll, I'll use the example of Ethiopia, the country where I'm based, where because there is such this huge drive for urbanization, the demand for housing, so water courses have often been uh, you know, neglected, and that has a huge cost in, in multiple ways. It has a cost in terms of the ability to get clean water to the capital. It has a cost in terms of the uh, impacts of flooding. When the rainy season happens now, because there's been so much construction, there is the flow of water is less controlled, and the standard of housing is, is not good enough relative to the, the need, and so you have this, this huge impact in terms of natural disasters. So the KPIs are trying to measure the cost of investing in, so in the budgets usually, you don't see very much money put towards the, the maintenance of rivers and wetlands, as an example. Typically, in, in, uh, in budgets, this will be way, way down the, the list of priorities. But in terms of, if you look at a natural capital accounting approach, this will actually be number one, because you can't live without drinking water. And that's what uh, uh, the KPIs are trying to adjust in terms of, of showing to, get, to use uh, that example. Uh, perhaps just on the question of risk, because I think the, w the problem that, country, that African countries are facing is that they are just translating the global risk. The banks are uh, essentially, because they are faced with the situation where if a disaster happens tomorrow, they have to protect our money, because all of us have our money in these banks. So they have to be able to show that if disaster strikes, they can go to the person who's borrowed the money and they can essentially recover it through an asset. And the problem that African countries face is that there is an amount of risk which is costed much higher than the rest of the world. 
Uh, I used that figure at the beginning, you know, the, the money mobilized in low-income countries was only 57 US dollars per head. And a lot of that is because the cost of capital is much higher in the developing world. Uh, you know, you, the, the European countries and, and highly developed countries can borrow. At one point, Germany was borrowing at, at less than zero, meaning that people were paying Germany to, how, to hold their debt. So unless we address this, there's a global issue and, and then there's the national uh, level. We have to find ways of reducing the cost at the national level to get money to the, to the entrepreneurs that need it. And the multiplier resilience effect will be, will be huge. Uh, but we need to understand as well the challenges that, uh, that the banks face to be able to find the appropriate solution. And hence the need for de-risking uh, and, and other elements because otherwise uh, we will just face with an, we'll be just faced with another problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jean-Paul. So I think, I mean, the last question about who is out of their minds, I think it wouldn't be fair to ask Francine or Alida that question, <laughs> or Thierry, for, for, for that matter. I think you've had enough difficult questions. So that leaves it to Natalie. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Who do you think is out of their minds? So I take it I'll be the therapist here. <laughs> yes. So we're not trying to gaslight anyone. Um, I think no one is out of their mind, as I think as it has been eloquently expressed here. Um, the, the significant um, constraints to the African banks to consider. But there are also real challenges for, for the entrepreneur um, to, to, to take on uh, as, as there are uh, um, a financial impact to a, a high risk perception. So as part of the solutions, and I'm, I'm not sure if I um, explained this well enough as I was presenting the Green Investment Facility, as part of the solutions that are being developed there uh, is, um, is a project preparatory facility. So not only providing uh, posture guarantee support or collateral support, but also providing technical assistance on feasibility studies, all of, all of which will go into um, de-risking uh, these sorts of investments. So w once that perception is lowered, uh, hopefully there will also be a, a subsequent, hopefully a subsequent impact on uh, the collateral requirement, but um, all of this is being taken into account and, and we're working on it, Glenn. But no one is crazy. And <laughs> thank you, Natalie. I'd like to thank everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, before closing the event, I'd like to talk about a challenge that we're officially starting at the end of the month. So um, this is important, especially for the entrepreneurs that are online that did not come today. Uh, so all young entrepreneurs with innovative ideas within the green sector, we're calling you to actually uh, send us your projects, your ideas, and we will select uh, a certain number of winners. The details will be coming on our social media platform. And the winners will be getting uh, a grant portion to, to help them implement their project but also advisory services to take them for, to a bankable stage. So before we go to a socializing and networking portion of the evening, I hope everyone leaves here sensitive about what climate actually means to your future and more eager as well to, to participate in, in greening the Rwandan economy. And I guess we have to go green or go home pretty much. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming.